Let's look at the allylic bromination of a compound like the one shown here. It's a dimethyl substituted cyclohexene. I've happened to choose the trans substituted dimethyl cyclohexene, but we would get exactly the same product if I had chosen the cis disubstituted compound to start with. And we'll see that as we discuss this reaction. We know that in allylic bromination, we have to worry about things like resonance. And in this case, because of the resonance, we get two different regioisomers. And we get the cis and trans substitution for both of those. So in this case, I'm talking about the cis and trans relative position of these two methyl groups. Here, I'm talking about the cis and trans relative position of the bromine and the methyl group. Let's look at the mechanism of this reaction, and we know that in this mechanism, the bromine the radical comes in and removes this hydrogen and takes one of the two electrons in that bond. The other one goes on to the carbon. We can look at this in three dimensions as well. So here's my bromine. Here is my cyclohexene starting reactant with my double bond, my two methyl groups. This is the hydrogen that's getting removed. And here are my arrows, the bromine, and one of the two electrons from this bond come together. The other electron goes onto this carbon. And we end up getting the radical. One of the things I want to point out to you, and this is why it doesn't matter whether I start with the cis or the trans um, reactant, is that as this radical forms, this carbon becomes sp2 hybridized, which means that this methyl group moves down into the plane of this system. And it would do that whether I started with the cis or the trans uh, reactant which means no matter which I started with this is the trans, I get the same radical intermediate. And let's look at that radical intermediate. And we can draw that radical something like this with a series of three sp2 hybridized carbon atoms, each with a p orbital on it in the same plane. And I've just shown the radical electron right there. I can draw this on the other side. So here's our radical, and I haven't shown the p orbitals over here like I've shown them over here. But we also know that in this case of this allylic radical, I can draw a resonance structure of that. And if I want to, I can show the allylic um, radical over here generating its resonance structure as well. And that's what we have here. We still have the three contiguous sp2 hybridized carbon atoms with p orbitals. We have the radical on the other carbon and the double bond between these two carbons now, which is exactly what was shown here. Now, the important thing to keep in mind is that since either of these radicals is completely planar, the Br group can attack from either the top or the bottom. So if we focus on this radical first, the Br can go to the top or the bottom. So this Br can come in and interact with this top lobe up here or the bottom lobe down here. And if it goes to the top lobe, it gives me one of my two products. The, I guess in this case it would be the trans. And if it goes to the bottom, the bromine and the methyl group will be pointing in the same direction. My two methyl groups be in opposite directions. So I get a mixture of these two products, one with the bromine going down, one with the bromine going up. And likewise, if I work with this resonance form of the radical, for this resonance form, again, the bromine can go to the bottom or the top. And if we look at that over here, it can go to this top orbital. It can go to the bottom lobe of the orbital. And depending on which side it attaches to, I get the different isomers of this second product. It's important to note that these arrows right here are not meant to represent mechanism arrows. They don't show the movement of electrons. They're just showing that the bromine can either go to the bottom or the top face of the molecule. 